thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be here today to introduce our second speaker in our cybersecurity topic area uh, speaker series. Um, Elaine Korzak is a good friend of mine and close colleague who is currently a cybersecurity fellow at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. Um, I keep forgetting the new name, uh, and formerly the Monterey Institute. Um, and um, before that, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Hoover Institute at Stanford and at CSAC at Stanford, the Center for International Security and Cooperation. She's also currently an affiliate at CSAC still. And um, she wrote her dissertation at um, King's, King's College London, right? At King's College London uh, on cybersecurity norm development internationally, looking at key states in, the, in Europe, uh, Russia, China, and the US, and uh, the UN processes around norm development around cybersecurity. And um, she has background in international law and the study of international security. And she's going to talk to you today about um, between rhetoric and reality, evolving cybersecurity governance at the United Nations. And uh, to give you a sense of the broader sweep of how this fits in, um, we've been developing this speaker series around issue, the issue area of cybersecurity from different perspectives, international and domestic, related to policy and government and politics. And there's no better person to talk to you about the international dimensions, the, the norm devel development dimensions around state behavior and international law in cybersecurity. So with no further ado, I turn it over to Elaine Korzak to take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for the very kind introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm very thrilled to be here. And as you can tell from the title, I'm a fan of Ella de Racy. Um, so today, I'm going to talk um, about what's going on at the United Nations. I'm going to throw a lot of information at you. And I will try to make it as exciting as possible and as dorky as possible, because I totally love this stuff. Um, but there's a lot of quotes, so uh, fair warning in the beginning, but I'll try to make it as painless as possible. So what I want to talk about today is evolving cybersecurity governance at the UN. And the way that's often framed is through headlines like this. No rules, internet security, or Hobbesian state of nature, um, which describes that life in cyberspace can be nasty, brutish, and short. So the implication of that is it's the Wild West out there. Cyberspace is an ungoverned space where anything can happen. Um, and then you have others that then say, well, if there's anything that can happen, we need to have some sort of governance structures. And what better place to turn to for this than the United Nations? So here is another one, um, Paul Meyer, a former Canadian ambassador, who wrote a piece saying, is cyber peace possible? Arguing that there is an urgent need for global rules around state conduct and cyberspace, um, but building new norms is a slow and complicated process. Is the UN up for the task? Um, so that basically sets up uh, what I want to go through with you for the next 40 minutes, mainly what's actually been going on at the UN. Um, where's the, how far have we come? What's the progress? And what about this urgent need for global rules? Um, are there actually no rules, or do we already have something to work with? So when I wanna, what I want to do today is follow the question, what should be the rules for states in cyberspace? Now, as a caveat, that's a very specific discussion. When we talk about norms in cyberspace or cyber norms, as they're often commonly referred to in um, main street, uh, mainstream literature, um, can mean a lot of different things. It can go from privacy uh, to hackbacks to human rights online to internet governance to a whole bunch of things. Now, what I want to focus on today is very specific. It's about rules that regulate what states can and cannot do in cyberspace, um, particularly with a focus on what they can do to use information and commu communicate communication technologies for military purposes. So what I want to cover today is to give you an overview of the state of discussions at the United Nations as the arguably most important international forum in the world, um, and then ask a few questions about, so given where we are today, what is the potential for the progress, and what impact do um, the governance structures that have evolved at the United Nations have on actual state behavior? Now, I'm going to do this very straightforward in two parts. Uh, the first one, I'm going to just walk you through what's been happening at the United Nations. And in the sec second part, I'm going to ask the question, so what's next? So what are the problems? What are the challenges? 
um, that this current state of discussion encounters in moving forward. Now, first part, UN discussions. So um, many don't know this, but discussions at the UN in terms of cybersecurity are rather old. They already started in 1998, so we're going on almost 20 years there. And they have started with, very interestingly, a Russian initiative. So actually, the Russian Federation came to the United Nations, particularly to the first committee that deals with disarmament and international security, already in 1998, and said, look, information and communication technologies, um, as they said, are great catalysts of economic growth, of societal development, but they also expressed concern that these technologies can be used for purposes that are inconsistent with the objectives of maintaining international stability and security and may adversely affect the security of states. So the Russian Federation in 1998 was really the first one that brought up this issue of what are the implications of um, this increased use of ICTs uh, for international and national security. And since then, they have submitted a resolution every year, every single year, uh, with a very convoluted title, Developments in the Field of Information and Telecommunications in the Context of International Security, which is diplomatic um, shorthand for we can't decide whether we can call it information security or cybersecurity, so we call it ICT security in the context of international security. Um, so this just as an aside, if you ever see this um, very long phrase, this is what this is shorthand for cybersecurity discussions at the United Nations. Now, um, as you've um, maybe seen, most of this discussion starting in 1998 was in frame, was framed in terms of a debate over a potential treaty. Particularly, Russia was pushing toward uh, the establishment of an international legal instrument to regulate state conduct in cyberspace, what states should be allowed and shouldn't be allowed to do in cyberspace. Uh, but that, didn't, that debate didn't really go anywhere. Particularly the US and other Western countries are very skeptical about the things that Russia wanted to have um, incorporated in such a treaty. And very ironically, 20 years later, here we are, um, they were particularly um, concerned about things such as information war that would also include disinformation campaigns, such as the ones that we've seen uh, throughout the US elections. So ironically, or not ironically enough, uh, nothing really happened um, with regards to the debate over an international treaty because there was massive skepticism from the Western side. Now, those were also the Bush years, so the UN discussions were really deadlocked for a number of years. Now, things picked up momentum again when in 2009, the Obama administration came in and adopted a so-called norms-based approach. After that, it all became about norms, and the debate very subtly shifted um, from talk about a treaty, about an international convention on cybersecurity along the lines of the Chemical Weapons Convention or the Biological Weapons Convention, uh, towards the debate on what is, quote unquote, responsible state behavior in cyberspace. And now from 2009, momentum really picked up, and the years from 2009 to today are really the ones I want to talk about today and walk you through what has happened. Because compared to 1998 to 2009, and then comparing 2009 to 2017, a tremendous amount in UN years and in UN achievement, a tremendous amount has happened. And most of the discussions have taken uh, place in the format of groups of governmental experts. Now, quick shows of show of hands, who has heard of the word GGE? Three? All right, um, as you can tell, so DGEs are very, very specific and somewhat esoteric diplomatic um, mechanisms. So they're usually installed by the United Nations, by, for example, the General Assembly, when they have a topic that they want a group of governmental experts to look at, they will give this group a mandate and they will say, go off, you have a year time, you have two years time, and then come back, report, um, come back and give us a report with your findings. Now, that's what a GGE is about. Now, the curious thing, usually those are used once or twice on a topic, uh, but GGEs in the context of cybersecurity have really had a unique career. They've also been described as the rock star of GGEs, and they've sort of become the established format for discussion and for moving the discussion forward in these things. Um, now, in total, we're at the number five of GGEs. So the first one you see is 2004, 2005. That one's easy. They didn't even come up with a report. They couldn't agree on a single sentence. So that, as you can see, uh, falls into the phase of deadlock. So that was a complete disaster. Nothing happened at all. 2000, 2009, 2010 was when the Obama administration came in. As I mentioned, there was momentum. The discussion started moving again. So they were the ones that um, 
that managed to come up with a report. Arguably, it, it didn't say a lot of groundbreaking things, but um, the achievement at that time was already that they could agree on something. Uh, now, 2012, 2013, and 2014, 2015 is where things get interesting. Those are two reports that have a lot of material in them, and countries all of a sudden started to agree on a lot of things. So th those are the things we'll be focusing on today. And then, uh, to make things interesting, 2016, 2017, so right now there is another GGE currently taking place, and everybody in this community is very... Uh, waiting for their results. They're going to come out this summer, and everybody's very psyched. Um, so, the main instrument. So, the main instrument is the group of governmental experts. Their output are consensus reports. Uh, so, what I'm going to do with you now is go through the main highlights of these consensus reports to tell you what countries um, have been able to agree on. So, um, and the first one is so. To give you an overview what those groups of governmental studies, sort of what their mandate looks like, it's fairly broad, so the General Assembly tells them to, quote, study with a view to promoting common understandings, existing and potential threats in the sphere of information security, and possible cooperative measures to address them. So that is fairly broad, could be anything, some might say. Um, so the GGE, the groups of the governmental experts, have turned this into three main areas that have come out of their discussion so far. One is norms, rules, and principles of responsible state behavior. The second one is confidence building measures. And the third one is capacity building measures. So they usually have a section where they describe the main threats to the ICT environment currently as a snapshot of when the report comes out. And then they have come to address these three areas in particular, and they come up with a bunch of measures that they recommend in those. So what I want to do now is go through all three of them. <laughs> and I hope you'll hang it in there with me. So what happened in those reports? So the first part, the norms, rules, and principles of uh, state behavior. Sorry. So this is the part that I'm very excited about, um, personally. So what happened? So in 2010, as I said, uh, was minimal agreement. Uh, the report didn't really say anything aside from the obvious. It said that the global network of ICTs has become an arena for disruptive activity. Arguably, in 2010, um, no great news. It also just said that further dialogue among states to discuss norms pertaining to state use of ICTs to reduce collective risk and protect, and protect critical national and international infrastructure is needed. So pretty straightforward. Now, in 2013 is where it gets interesting, because there's been this long-standing debate between Russia, later joined by China, and Western states, particularly the US and the UK, and other European states about the need for an international treaty. Now, underlying this argument that there should be an international treaty was Russia arguing that the international laws that we have right now are inadequate or ill-equipped to address cyber threats. Now, on the other hand, Western countries have been arguing, no, 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 they are adequate and we should apply them, therefore we don't need a new treaty. So we really had those two arguments, those two positions at a standstill, and they were just both reiterated um, both in the United Nations as well as in our other fora outside of the, Uni outside of the United Nations by both camps. Now, 2013 uh, was a landmark report that floored a lot of people because all of a sudden Russia and China agreed to the very simple sentence that international law applies to cyberspace. So as you can imagine, for Western countries, that was heralded as a major diplomatic breakthrough. We've finally got them on the same page as us. And with that, a lot of the argument for an international treaty um, sort of went out the window. Um, and it very simply just stated that the application of norms derived from existing international law relevant to the use of ICTs by states is an essential measure to reduce risks to international peace, security, and stability. Now, here's where the devil's in the detail. So every, all the states, all the um, governmental experts could agree on that international law is applicable to cyberspace. But then the controversy was shifted to, well, it's applicable, but then when you try to implement it, when you actually look at the case-by-case -case studies, then it gets tricky. And then common understandings on how that works need to be established. So then it also very explicitly said that common applications on how such norms shall apply to state behavior and the use of ICTs by states require further study. So this was saying we've sort of um, discussed one part of the problem. Now there's the much bigger problem of implementation. How do you actually do that in reality? And then in um, a slight compromise between those two camps vying for new norms and the camp saying that the existing laws that we have right now should be applied, 
we have another sentence saying that given the unique attributes of ICTs, additional norms could be developed over time. So you seem somewhat of a compromise between two camps saying international law as a bulk applies, but there may be some wiggle room if um, we try to apply things and then there are problems. Because of the unique attributes of ICTs, there is always room to develop additional norms. But the wholesale international legal framework as we have right now is our first starting point. Um, now, um, this is one of the main sentences in the report, the sentence that very straightforward just says, international law and in particular the Charter of the United Nations is applicable. So that's a very straightforward sentence for international lawyers. It took the diplomatic community about 15 years to arrive at that. <laughs> but every international lawyer was very happy to see that sentence. And following this sentence, the report also laid out it highlighted other international legal areas that the groups of um, government, that the group of governmental experts found to be uh, applicable. So they highlighted certain areas such as state responsibility, um, that sovereignty applies to cyberspace, and also that human rights apply to cyberspace. Now, one area when we think of the use of ICTs in the context of conflict that was conspicuously absent was international humanitarian law, the body of law that regulates um, the conduct of hostilities and how states can conduct hostilities during wartime, that one was absent. Because to this day, the application of international humanitarian law um, remains highly contentious. Uh, so we have China in particular, they don't want um, IHL recognized because they argue once we recognize it, that actually encourages uh, state use of ICTs. Um, and whereas Western countries say, well, that actually brings regulation into this realm. If you don't recognize it, then you leave this whole gray area and debate open. Now, so 2013 was a major breaking point. Everybody got, um, so to speak, on the same page with regard to international law applying to cyberspace. Now, in 2015, um, expectations were pretty low that states could agree on anything more than that. Uh, but uh, it turned out they could. So 2015 was the year that it was all about the norms. And um, a set of norms that were introduced and proposed by the United States um, was included in the report. So that was also heralded as a major achievement for um, US diplomatic efforts. Uh, but the devil again is in the details. So those are voluntary and non-binding norms. Um, so the experts agreed that here's a list of norms we think states should consider when they're doing business or when they're doing shenanigans in cyberspace. Uh, but they are voluntary and non-binding. So they didn't set much precedent. Now, two norms that have um, gotten a lot of traction or were widely reported um, was one saying that states should not attack critical infrastructure, and the other one was saying that states should not engage in hostile activity towards CERT's um, computer emergency response teams. Um, now, for those interested, I have put up the language of each of those, but we can sort of go uh, back to those in Q&A if there's more interest in that. Um, it's very much diplomatic speak. Um, you can see the first one, not intentionally damage critical infrastructure, and then um, not knowingly support activity to harm the information systems of the authorized emergency response teams. Now, there were also a couple of others that I found very interesting and curious. So one that didn't get reported at all, but which I found very interesting internationally was that states, uh, was that the experts also put down that states should encourage responsible reporting of ICT vulnerabilities and share associated information on available remedies to such vulnerabilities to limit and possibly eliminate potential threats to ICTs and ICT dependent infrastructure. Now, I found this very interesting because in the US internally, there is a debate about when you have a vulnerability, what should happen with it, who gets to use it, when do you have to disclose it. And for some reason, um, I think this paragraph has potentially a lot of implications because it puts this on an international stage and it puts in a presumption that whatever responsible reporting means, but there should be, there should be reporting on an international level. But it hasn't really received a lot of attention and there hasn't been a lot of follow up on what this um, norm could actually mean. And now um, the other one uh, was the second one and that was curiously proposed by Russia and everybody was a little bit confused why exactly Russia came up with this. But they said in case of ICT incidents, states should consider all relevant information, including the larger context of the event, the challenges of attribution, the ICT environment, and the nature and extent of the consequences. So this was really um, leveled at when we have international incidents and countries or government agencies are trying to sign attribution and say who it was that there should be 
um, pause and that there should be a broader consideration of all the relevant facts. Um, again, it's sort of unclear what this is supposed to mean in practice and how to follow up on this, but I just um, thought it was interesting to see uh, that Russia came up with this. Um, now, the other interesting thing in 2015 reports, so we have a bunch of voluntary non-binding norms um, thrown out in countries. The other one is that that report split norms for state behavior and a section on how international law applies to the use of ICTs. So before, norms in international law were one thing, and they were all in the same section, um, discussed together. So either you know, international law applies or we need new norms. And then 2015, we all of a sudden have the split between binding international law that is applicable and then voluntary non-binding norms that could be developed. So um, one of the questions that I want to follow up um, with in a research paper this year is why is there this split? And maybe I um, would argue that some countries use this strategically to get away from the international law debate and then still have some movement in terms of law development. Now, so the main takeaways in terms of norms, rules, and principles of responsible state behavior is that we have tremendous movement. Compared to the years before, we have a tremendous amount of stuff coming out of the GGE between 2013 and 2015. And most importantly, we have the question of international law settled. And with that, in part, we have the question about an international treaty more or less settled. And in addition, we have a bunch of voluntary norms that have um, become quite infamous internationally. Now, are there any questions about norms? I know that was a lot of material to cover. No? All right, then we're moving right on to confidence building measures. Uh, okay, um, this is very much analogous to confidence building measures you know in other fields. So nuclear weapons, um, chemical, biological weapons, other um, defense areas. It's very much anal analogous. It is about um, measures to reduce the risk of misperception. Um, so one of the things that the 2010 report recommended was that states were to exchange um, their national views on the use of ICTs in, in conflict and also exchange information on national leg legislation um, and security strategies and technologies, policies, and best practices. So this really was just to say that we live in a very opaque world where it's not really clear which um, units countries are developing, what strategies are behind it, what's the doctrine governing those units or those things. So really this is a plea to say this should be, this field just like other fields in defense should be a lot more transparent. Now the 2010 report um, again bids on that and proposes a set of practical confidence building measures, what they call practical confidence building measures to help increase transparency, predictability, and cooperation. Now again, those are voluntary and they include things that we know um, from other domains, so the exchange of views, the creation of consultative frameworks, and the exchange of information between the computer emergency response teams. Now, um, the confidence building measures part of the report also highlights progress made bilaterally and regionally in other organizations such as the OSCE. Sorry, I forgot the slide there. Um, so yeah, so we have practical confidence building measures um, that are voluntary. Now 2015, um, same thing, it basically builds on the voluntary confidence building measures and adds a few points so that countries should have points of contact. So if there's an international incident, sort of one counterpart in an agency knows who to call in another country's agency. Consultation mechanisms, countries should establish computer emergency response team. Um, but then also uh, what I thought might be interesting for the lab was that it also includes a provision on infrastructure. Um, the voluntary provision by states of their national views of categories of infrastructure that they consider critical and national efforts to protect them. So to bring in transparency into this field. Um, and also to facilitate cross-border cooperation to address critical infrastructure vulnerabilities that transcend national borders. So it recommends that states um, should pick up these things and talk about them. So again, uh, the main takeaways from the confidence building section, we see um, that there is a lot of voluntary measures proposed. There is incremental increase. We have a set in 2013, then we have a bunch of things added in 2015, and it also heavily cross-references activities and efforts in other, sorry, in other um, organizations. Now, the last part, almost done. 
Um, any questions on confidence building measures? In terms of uh, responses to confidence building measures from states, what's the percentage that actually is submitted at CES? I'll get to that. Oh, okay. Good question. Thanks. We'll cover that. Uh, so the last one, confidence building, uh, capacity building measures. So here we really talk about the digital divide and the idea that if we're trying to secure ICT networks globally, um, it's always about the weakest link. And if we have countries that um, don't have the luxury to put cybersecurity, let alone a bunch of other things, on the top of their priority list, uh, we need to help those countries because securing those countries will make everybody globally secure ultimately. So that's the argument behind um, supporting capacity building within the context of international security discussions at the United Nations. So the 2013 report, for example, just states this, saying that capacity building is of vital importance to an effective cooperative global effort um, on securing ICTs and their use, and saying that some states may require assistance in their efforts to improve the security of critical ICT infrastructure, develop technical skill and appropriate legislation, strategies, and regulatory frameworks to fulfill their responsibilities and bridge the divide in the security of ICTs and their use. Um, now, we see that in 2015, it basically um, builds on that. The group endorses the recommendations of the 2010 and 2013 reports. Um, but then, interestingly, it says that it's not only about the transfer of technology. It's more than that. Um, so as you can see on the slide before, it's about legislation, best practices. So it's more than a transfer of knowledge and the skills. Um, and it involves, um, so yeah, it's more than the technology, but it also involves a transfer of knowledge and skills from developed to developing countries so that all states can learn from each other about the threats that they face and effective responses to those threats. Um, now, it also, as all the other parts, uh, provides a list of voluntary measures to provide both technical and other assistance. So one is, for example, to um, cooperate in certs uh, in the establishment of certs. Another one is to share legal ad and administrative best practices. So this is, for example, in terms of cybercrime legislation, that certain that countries uh, provide other countries with sample legislation. Um, and another one is um, a somewhat controversial one for some countries is to assist in providing access to technologies essential for ICT security. So then we talk about technology transfer. Now, all in total, running through this gamut of voluntary measures in all three areas, where does that get us? So we have an impressive and expanding set of measures. Again, I've said this before, but sort of we, if we look at the time frame since 2013, we've really come a long way in UN time and in UN distance. And we have a framework evolving in all three areas of norms, confidence building measures, and capacity building measures, which we've also seen in other areas of international security. So with this, we've really seen out of this form, out of the United Nations, we've seen the most comprehensive attempt at governing state behavior in this space so far. But obviously, as you've noticed, most of those measures, most of those recommendations are voluntary and non-binding. And as I have alluded to with international human, humanitarian law, for example, there are a lot of contentious areas uh, that are not directly addressed in those reports because there was no room for consensus on those. So the main question is, we've come this far, we have this bunch of voluntary non-binding norms, what do we do with them now? What's the next step? Can I ask, kind of, just to show my ignorance, so this group of experts prepares a report. Yes. It gets submitted. Does that then get formally accepted by the General Assembly or something, or is it just a report that sits somewhere? Ha, so very good question. Depends from year to year. So in the beginning, we would get the report, so to you want to say it? Okay. Uh, so it depends from group to group. So usually in the beginning, 2010, 2013, uh, they got submitted to the General Assembly, and then the General Assembly would have their yearly resolution, and they would say, thank you for the report. We acknowledge it. Basically, we acknowledge its acceptance. Uh, now, 2015 was very interesting. They acknowledged it, and then they said, we recommend that states are, be guided in their behavior by the findings of the report. So in UN parlance, it's a small step, but it's a significant enough step in UN parlance to say, look, this is more legitimate than before we just take notice. So it's, it's moving there. And in terms of international legal development, you could argue then that 
forms part of customary international law development because that is a statement of views of states on the law. So I admit, in the grand scheme of things, it's sort of it's baby steps, baby steps, uh, but they're the critical baby steps that form the baseline of any norms that could regulate state behavior. Any other questions at this point? All right, so what's next? Um, so right now I just want to go through the major points um, that await us. So one is you've seen this ridiculous amount of GGE. So the question internationally now as the fifth GGE is doing his work is what comes afterwards? Is the group of governmental experts that is a small group of experts the right formats, the right institutional uh, perspective to move forward this international debate? on cybersecurity. So now there's talk, um, there's rumors about what's going to happen post GGE, whether there will be a last, uh, whether there will be another GGE or whether this is the last GGE, the GGE to end all GGEs. Um, and if it's not going to be another GGE, then what's the appropriate forum for this discussion um, to go forward so it doesn't go somewhere to die? And the main um, argument here is that if you have a small group of interest to countries or individuals, then you can make a lot of progress in a short amount of time, and then you can work on um, broadening it out. Whereas, on the other hand, you have the universalists that argue, well, then you have a small group of countries dictating to the rest uh, some findings or some recommendations that they didn't have any involvement in coming up with in the first place. So we have this tension between um, trying to come up with something speedy enough um, versus the universal appeal that you will have to have um, for these recommendations to be taken seriously by the larger UN membership. So if we talk about UN membership that is currently at 192 or 93 countries, and then the GGEs um, started out with 15 member states, then went up to 20 member states, and the current GGE has 25 member states. So then we see that that is a fraction of the actual UN membership. So it's a big um, debate and tension on how to still make progress in a short amount of time, but then also still have impact internationally. Now, the second um, question of what's next is more imminently the outcome of this GGE, of the 2016-2017 GGE. Now, um, most observers have a pessimistic outlook saying that um, we've seen these massive catalogs of recommendations and norms and confidence building measures, that that basically exhausted the room uh, for consensus already, that there is little room for movement in those two. So now uh, rumor is that the focus is being shifted to capacity building. Sort of um, a cynical way to look at it is to say that everybody can agree on that. There's not a lot of um, room for um, political controversy on that. Um, but for example, here you see an article by Brandon Valeriano and Alison Pitlick. Um, yeah, very, very pessimistic, saying that cybersecurity and the coming failure of the U.S. group of governmental experts, um, where they argue why they don't think um, this is going to be, um, the report 2017 is going to show significant progress. Now, um, to come back to your question now, um, we have these reports, we have these massive recommendations and things. What about the implementation? So there's a lot of people saying we should actually shift away, we should shift our focus, not focus on what kinds of voluntary recommendations the 2017 GGE can come up with, but we should actually instead focus on the recommendations that we already have and work on implementing them so they actually make an impact on state actions. So here, for example, uh, Michelle Markov is the um, State Department representative in the group of governmental experts, and she said in an interview February 2017, the UN group should encourage member states to adopt existing cyber rules. So it's also expectation management that not a lot of new things might come out of, out of this GG, and the way to go is actually to focus on implementation. Now, what do we have so far in terms of implementation? In the norm sphere, we have a lot of bilateral agreements that have been proliferating in the last couple of years. I think the most famous one is the U.S.-China agreement. Everybody, has everybody heard of that? Who has, who has heard of it? Show of hands. All right, so there's been a bilateral agreement between Russia and China, um, between President Obama and President Xi Jinping, um, about stopping a whole bunch of cyber things, but the main one that got reported in the press was that um, cyber-enabled espionage for economic purposes um, 
would be uh, prohibited or should be illegal, should be unlawful. So this is really aimed at Chinese espionage of U.S. companies. Um, so that was uh, heralded as a major breakthrough. It was also heralded as sort of a good example of the U.N. Um, norms trickling down to bilateral agreements. Now, um, the paragraph on critical infrastructure protection and a couple of other things from the 2015 report were also picked up in a G20 communique. So that was also a way, um, seen as a way to um, move it outside of the UN membership to make it better known. In another group of states, um, now also in regional organizations, they're picking some, they're picking up some of these aspects, so the OEC is looking at some of the implementation and actually trying to articulate the very abstract recommendations that we have in the report um, down to a more manageable <laughs> level. So countries, for example, in Latin America, when they see such a norm, they actually have a better idea of what that entails, what they need to work on, um, which things they need to put in place if they wanted to follow such a norm. Uh, now, with regard to confidence building measures, we see a very heavy effort in the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. They really have taken on the cyber confidence building measures topic. They've um, agreed to a set of uh, measures in 2013 and then another set of in 2016. So one of the things there, they want to have universal um, submission. So everybody in the OSCE is supposed to submit uh, points of contacts. For example, so that was part of the, so that committee is chaired by the U.S., so that was the goal of the U.S., and they were getting close to that. They were, they were missing a couple of countries. So that's one of the things they were pushing for implementation on that front. Now, in capacity building, um, it's sort of interesting. There have been some high-level profiles. So, for example, the U.K. has established a cyber capacity center at the University of Oxford, and the Netherlands has launched a major multilateral initiative on this. But it hasn't really received a lot of international attention, or even attention in the cybersecurity community. Um, but the major problems there moving forward and trying to implement um, these national initiatives is that there's no international coordination among them. Everybody's sort of trying to do their own thing. And there's also little dialogue with the international development assistance community on how to do capacity building. Um, now, the last, the major point um, when we think about implementation and where implementation stands is the credibility issues. Uh, so this is the main example that's cited. Um, so this is an article by Kim Zetter at Wired on the cunning and unprecedented hack of the Ukrainian power grid in December 2015. So the Ukrainian power grid got attacked. Uh, so that was right after the UN group of experts came out with the infamous voluntary non-binding norm that critical infrastructure shouldn't be attacked. Um, so that, of course, you don't need to be a cynic um, to point out that, well, the impact of the UN's group, um, UN's group um, and their work seems to be a bit limited if you have, on the one hand, on paper, countries are saying you shouldn't attack critical infrastructure, and then you turn around and something, a major incident like this happens. So um, credibility is a major issue um, that the progress within the GGE or the progress within the UN has to grapple with. And we've seen many more incidents, high-profile incidents, that have hit the news all throughout the negotiations of the UN. So we have Stuxnet, we have the Snowden revelations, we have the Ukrainian power grid that I've just pointed out, also the um, misinformation campaign during the US elections. Um, so one way to look at it is to ask, has the GGE work been undermined by that? Is it basically a paper tiger and it's been shown in reality that it doesn't work, that there is this discrepancy between rhetoric and reality? Or can we also say that, on the other hand, maybe the norms development work preceded even in spite of that, that we have sort of all these things happening outside, but at the end of the day, states could still agree, come together and agree that this should be the bottom line. Um, so, as a summary of all the voluntary non-binding norms that I, and recommendations that I have thrown at you and of the issues facing the GGE and the international community moving forward, I would say two things. That um, the important parts or that important parts um, are not well known. 
So we have things like capacity building that, to my mind, have a great potential and that a lot of countries can agree on that there should be movement, but they're not covered in the mainstream media and they're also, they also don't receive a lot of attention in the cybersecurity community. On the other hand, the sexy topics, the ones that deal with conflict in cyberspace, um, norms and confidence building measures, sort of the ones that remind, remind us of the nuclear era, they receive a lot of attention, um, but ironically, um, they're also the ones that are most controversial, and they're the ones that are also prone to be undermined by state actions. So that's where we left with a lot of attention in one area um, that seems the UN, that uh, makes the UN discussions appear to be um, um, lacking credibility and not having a lot of impact on state behavior, whereas the ones that could have the potential to greatly impact and move forward state behavior and cybersecurity are the ones that are not very well covered.